In Plato's Symposium, there is a story told by a fictional version of the historical Greek playwright Aristophanes, describing the origins of love. He tells of an ancient time where people looked like two bodies stuck together, possessing two sets of legs, arms, and eyes. These people were categorized into three genders. Men were two men stuck together, women were the same, and the third, which was made up of man and woman, was called androgynous. The gods were afraid of these beings, as they were unbelievably strong and planned to rise against the celestial beings. So Zeus took action, raining down lightning bolts on everyone, cutting them all in half. Because of this split, humans now spend their entire lives trying to find their other halves. So females look for women, males look for men, and androgynous look for the opposite gender, and believe they will never feel whole without them. Aristophanes ends his myth by warning the audience to worship the gods, especially Eros, the god of love. If they do not honor these beings, the gods could split humans once again, leaving us with one leg, one arm, one eye. Those that respect and worship Eros will find their other half, and by extension, find personal wholeness. This work by Plato, and the story just described, have been analyzed and recontextualized for thousands of years. It presents some of the first written discussions of homosexual attraction, though the text loses some progression points as it states that the love between two women isn't as true as a love between two bros. Most importantly, this myth popularized the idea of love as the search for one's other half, where satisfaction is found externally rather than internally. One place where this story has been directly confronted is in an off-Broadway musical turned cult classic movie about a transgender East Berlin woman performing punk rock in tacky seafood restaurants. Don't you know me, Kansas City? I'm the new Berlin Wall. Try to tear me down! In 2001, John Cameron Mitchell directed, wrote, and starred in a film adaptation of his off-Broadway punk rock musical titled Hedwig and the Angry Inch. Featuring music written by Stephen Trask, the film version takes what is often described as a musical monologue and expands it into a visually creative movie. The plot follows the titular Hedwig, a transgender woman who immigrates from communist East Berlin to the United States in pursuit of her mythical other half. It's a film full of powerful, catchy music, fantastic main performances, and a way ahead of its time plotline and themes that remain relevant today. The film and the stage play are often considered stories about a transgender person, but this description is not only inaccurate to the film, but also misrepresents the transgender experience. Hedwig's genderqueer narrative is less of an examination of the general genderqueer experience and more of an argument against the origin of love myth opting rather to encourage self-love and self-expression through the lens of gender, or the lack thereof. <laughs> Hedwig and the Angry Inch as a film is structured in an odd way. It's a mixture of Hedwig telling the audience, those at the concerts and those sitting at home, her life story, along with the present-day plotline where they track down a past lover who's stolen their music. In between are narratively fulfilling and emotionally effective musical numbers, along with visually exaggerated and impressionistic sequences. The conclusion itself is ambiguous, with many detractors of the film believing it supports heteronormativity. The lack of easily available discourse around this film, especially from genderqueer people, is the main reason why I decided to make this video. While I myself am not a part of the LGBTQ community, I did read through some academic articles and some less academic Reddit comments to get a better understanding of how this film plays in today's climate with genderqueer people. My main goal with this video is to start a discussion about this film, to analyze the themes of the piece and see if it holds up today. I may inevitably get some terminology or information wrong. And I definitely don't want to even begin to insinuate that I can properly represent the LGBTQ experience. I just really love this movie and the way it makes me feel, and I want more people to be aware of it. Hedwig's journey is full of hardship and trauma, with their sex change operation being forced upon them. As a young man named Hansel, growing up in East Berlin, he is groomed by an American GI named Luther, who buys Hansel wigs and dresses in order for him to appear more feminine. Damn, Hansel. I can't believe you're not a girl. You're so fine. 
The two decide to get married and move to America, but immigration and international laws require the marriage to be between a heterosexual couple. Hansel's mom gives them her name, Hedwig, and brings them to a back alley doctor for a sex change operation. Hedwig awakens to find the operation was botched, with the wound healing improperly, leaving the newly appointed Hedwig with the titular angry inch in place of normal genitalia. Soon after moving to Junction City, Kansas, Luther leaves Hedwig for a cisgendered guy, abandoning them to try and figure out their new role in life. Hedwig's gender reassignment is not fully consensual. It doesn't come from a traditional transgender desire to feel comfortable in their skin, but rather from a need to conform to societal norms. Alone in their despair, Hedwig finds solace in embracing their feminine side, as described in the song Wig in a Box. They start getting new wigs, applying makeup, and rediscovering their love for the non-conforming rock and rollers of their time. In this moment, Hedwig creates their new rock star image along with the accompanying band The Angry Inch. Hedwig and the band perform cover songs, but Hedwig truly shines when singing songs specific to their experience, like Wicked Little Town. The song's lyrics express hopelessness in their current situation, but also how they find solace in their music. This song deeply impacts Tommy, a young Christian boy with a love for classic rock and a desire to get the hell out of this small town. He and Hedwig soon form a relationship, sharing music, performing together, and living in Hedwig's trailer. Their romance soon falls through as Tommy can't get past Hedwig's angry inch. I love you, I love you. The love the took me, honey! leaving them and taking their lyrics and his stage name, Tommy Gnosis, with him. Tommy soon becomes a big rock star, selling out stadiums and infecting the airwaves with Hedwig's words. Hedwig begins to tour across the country, staying one step behind Tommy so they can eventually confront him. By some freak coincidence, is performing right next door at Bush Stadium. And to whom I taught everything he knows and has apparently forgotten about their new band includes their third partner, Yitzhak, a man who desperately wants to present as a woman but is constantly restrained by Hedwig due to their own insecurity about not being able to fully present as a woman. As the movie reaches its climax and Hedwig has reached their lowest point, Tommy picks them up and they try to rekindle their relationship. It all falls apart again as Hedwig points out that one of the lines from Origin of Love is sung wrong. Wait, did you say the sirens? No, no, the, you just sang the Cyrus on that recording. The Cyrus, Cyrus, the Cyrus, the Cyrus, the God. It's a, there's no God called Cyrus, it's Osiris, it's an Egyptian God. Remember we read that? This argument results in a car crash, which brings career destruction to Tommy while elevating Hedwig's notoriety. When they perform at one of their largest shows, Hedwig seems to have a full-on breakdown, haunted by their past relationships, trauma, and general isolating feelings. At this point, the movie becomes more surreal and metaphorical, leaving the finale open for interpretation. On a basic level, Tommy reprises Wicked Little Town, but changes the lyrics so as to apologize for his young naivete and for taking Hedwig's music, and ostensibly their identity. The film then cuts to Hedwig, still wearing only gray briefs and the Gnosis Silver Cross from before, standing on stage with their band in all white. Here they perform Midnight Radio, a song of solidarity for the misfits and losers. Your blood knows the way. 
Hedwig also gives Yitzhak her own wig, allowing her to become her true self. We see Hedwig's tattoo of two separate faces have now joined into one as they walk naked out of an alley into the night. Now that we have the plot laid out, let's start our analytical rewatch. <laughs> The film begins with a performance of Tear Me Down, which not only introduces us to the style and attitude of the movie, but also to Hedwig themselves. The song compares Hedwig's non-binary nature to the Berlin Wall. I'm the new Berlin Wall. Try to tear me down. A neutral divide between a societal binary. Hedwig stands in the middle between man and woman, or more accurately, the societal ideas of what makes a man and a woman. Yitzhak narrates a section of the song describing the wall and how it became a symbol for the Cold War. But then after it fell, the world didn't know who they were anymore. There was no cause to rally behind. To Hedwig, they see themselves like that wall. Not only a divide between the genders, but as something that defines the two genders. Ain't much of a difference between a bridge and a wall. Well, I'd be right in the middle of it. Wow, we at all. Hedwig is a symbol of gender queerness, something people can rally against as it disrupts their lives, or something that points out the arbitrary nature of gender. In this sense, Hedwig can both divide the binaries and point out their flaws, bringing them together. But once Hedwig's gone, what is left to define the differences between man and woman besides societal standards? Hedwig's trauma and confusion is powered by the societal standards of gender performance. Growing up in communist Berlin, Hedwig, who at this time was Hansel, grew up listening to counterculture rock stars like David Bowie and Lou Reed, embracing a non-conforming wife. Yet, they were always told by their mom, Absolute mach für dir den Charakter. Absolute. Implying that power, and also control, will ruin their life. Despite embracing punk aesthetics, Hedwig grows up to become submissive and passive in their life, which are normally attributed as feminine features. This makes it easy for Luther to convince Hansel that in order for the two to be married, they can't just present as a woman, but they must surgically become a woman. To be free, one must give up a little part of oneself. The film transitions to the song Angry Inch, with Hedwig's blood curdling scream and the smiling faces of Luther and their mother blinding them onto the stage. This shows that this moment is a clear source of trauma and anger in Hedwig's life as the editing matches the blood-pumping, rage-inspiring music. Hedwig frames this sex change as a moment of regression. Six inches five inches back, I got him, I got him, angry inch. The improperly healed mound of flesh is a constant reminder of the sex they used to be, and the misfortune they currently live with. They also describe the operation as being forced upon them. The train is coming and I'm tied to the track. Hedwig was clearly happy being a gay man, but European and American society dictated that only a woman and a man can be together. Even worse, the relationship between Luther and Hedwig is short-lived as he leaves them stuck in a trailer park in Junction City. As far as the film shows, Hedwig begins to experience dysphoria at this moment, feeling uncomfortable in their role, which is yet to become concretely man or woman. Hedwig has already assumed a disguise as a woman with braided hair, but they begin to find comfort when they fully embrace a feminine image, as described in Wig in a Box. Okay, everybody. I put on some makeup. Turn on the A track. I'm putting the wig down from the shelf. Suddenly I'm this punk rock star of stage and This transformation, while still attempting to fit within the biarchy, 
is a choice that Hedwig makes. They find solace within control, within power over their appearance. Yet this change still brings confusion and heartache, as seen with the relationship with Tommy. While he can relate to Hedwig's desire for fame and change, and he even admires their knowledge and talent, Tommy is still unable to fully embrace Hedwig as a woman due to her angry inch. I told him my story. I'm from East Berlin. There was a big war. That mound of flesh is, again, a constant reminder to Hedwig that they will never fully be man or woman, always something in between. After Tommy leaves, taking their songs with him, Hedwig begins to become more bitter and spiteful, especially towards Yitzhak, as she oftentimes is more capable of presenting as female due to her high voice. Hedwig is also frustrated by her philosophy of love, as described in the song Origin of Love, a particularly Hedwig-esque version of the symposium myth. They believe that they must find their other half, and that they will never feel whole or normal without them. You had a way so familiar, I could not recognize, cause you had blood on your face. I had blood in my eyes, but I could swear by your expression that the pain down in your soul By extension, Hedwig believes their dysphoria can be eased once they find someone that can dictate their gender role, be it a man or a woman. They believe they need someone else to define who they are. It is clear that I must find my other half, but is it a he or a she? What does this person look like? Identical to me? Or somehow complementary? Does my other half have what I don't? Hedwig constantly tries to find solace in other people, most often in their lovers, but this always seems to backfire as those people are not whole themselves. Luther is a gay man seemingly ashamed of his attraction to the same sex until he forces Hedwig to become a woman. Tommy, as he later admits, is just a boy, a teenager with a privileged and tiny world experience. Yitzhak is clearly uncomfortable in her own skin, looking for validation as a woman from someone who is self-conscious about their feminine performance. Hedwig's philosophy dictates that they must find another person to complete them, to define their gender, but the society Hedwig experiences dictates that they will never be able to find that other half without first conforming to one of two genders. Hedwig's dysphoria is exacerbated as they are trapped by societal expectations, and these restrictions only serve to discourage and hurt them. Hedwig is so used to being beaten down by life, it's no wonder they see themselves as a wall covered in graffiti, blood, and spit. After the car accident and Hedwig's newfound success, they perform on stage but succumb to a mental breakdown, seemingly haunted by the various failed relationships and misconnections in their life. At the same time, images of Tommy beginning the reprise are intercut with this breakdown, before Hedwig runs into another room where Tommy is illuminated by a spotlight. <laughs> I believe this scene portrays an internal struggle within Hedwig, the struggle between their outward appearance and their internal feelings. Tommy in this moment is a symbol for Hedwig's music, just as Wicked Little Town is about how music leads us through the darkest, most isolating moments of our lives, the reprised lyrics reveal inner truths to Hedwig. The beginning sees Tommy apologizing for not being mature enough or whole enough to accept Hedwig for who they are, which is more than a woman or a man. He also acknowledges what he took from them, their identity-defining music, concluding that, that when everything starts breaking down, you take the pieces off the ground. Show this wicked town something beautiful and new. 
The second verse seems to be more abstract. Visually, this is when Tommy starts to actually look at Hedwig while he performs, implying some sort of change within the song and performance. I believe this is the transition to the more metaphorical part of the song, where Hedwig is actually confronted by their inner self. Tommy sings about how Hedwig believes fate and luck has determined their path in life. You think that luck has left you there But maybe there's nothing up in the sky but air And there's no mystical design No cosmic lover pre-assigned Maybe there is no fate, no reason, no order. In this last part, where Tommy sings about how this reliance on fate has isolated Hedwig during this confusing time, he now appears closer to Hedwig, standing in front of them just as bare as them. The song concludes with the chorus. I believe that Tommy in this moment, or more specifically in the second half of the song, represents Hedwig's music and how it portrays the truth. From childhood, music was an escape for Hedwig, and after Luther leaves them, performing music as a nationally ignored punk rock star serves as a method of recovery. Hedwig's music tells their life story according to them, and the band itself is called the Angry Inch. This creative output is their way of dealing with all of their past traumas, embracing a hyper-feminine disguise and taking ownership of the genital scar that causes their dysphoria. Yet up to this point, none of Hedwig's songs have had a conclusion about their identity, about the end of this story. The rockstar version of Hedwig is what they considered their real identity. So when Tommy stole those songs, he stole that part of Hedwig. He stole that other half they've been looking for. And worst of all, he doesn't even fully understand what these songs mean to them, as seen in the limo scene. Tommy the person is not the external half Hedwig needs to be whole, but Tommy the metaphor represents the music, the creative field Hedwig chose to represent themselves as the missing half. According to Metaphor Tommy, you were so and their music represents that. Hedwig now realizes that they are something beautiful and new. After this sequence, Hedwig returns to stage, sans makeup and clothes, save gray underwear and the silver forehead cross Tommy wore, further cementing how that music completes Hedwig. They perform Midnight Radio, a new song representing this new perspective on life and themselves. Hedwig sings about finding inner peace. It ends with a motion for togetherness, for support.
Now that Hedwig has found inner peace, they can begin to inspire positivity and change, to support the other misfits in their life. In the final moments of the film, Hedwig's tattoo becomes whole, representing the wholeness within them, as they walk naked into the night, naked for the world to see. The final moment, for me, implies that Hedwig has embraced their non-binary self, no longer needing feminine or masculine clothes or actions to represent who they are. They could confidently go into the world, naked for the eye to see. This isn't the end for Hedwig, it's the end of this part of their journey, and the beginning of the rest of their life as someone more than any god could plan. Hedwig thematically critiques the origin of love, showing how relying on societal norms does more harm than good, how we should embrace the hidden parts of ourselves that make us feel comfortable and make us feel whole. We don't need to conform to society or rely on how others define us in order to be happy or comfortable with ourselves. The message of tearing down societal norms, which includes the gender binary, could possibly be seen as discouraging to transgender people who feel comfortable identifying as either male or female. Mitchell and company, whether intentional or not, actually managed to address this in the character arc of Yitzhak and her relationship with Hedwig. Yitzhak is a man, Hedwig's second marriage partner, who clearly wants to embrace her femininity and present as a woman. She tries on wigs, hits powerful high notes, and has a fairly high-pitched voice trying to be more masculine. I'm playing the role of Angel in Broadway Cruises Polynesian Tour of Rent, so fuck you too, Miss Hedwig. It's important to note that Yitzhak traditionally is played by a woman, and that's no exception here. Hedwig constantly belittles Yitzhak and denies her the feminine side of herself. They constantly fight on stage, especially whenever she hits a high note, and Hedwig takes a toxically dominating position within their relationship. At their lowest point, Hedwig tears up Yitzhak's passport when she attempts to leave the band and ostensibly Hedwig. Hedwig extends the cycle of abuse in their life, letting control of others corrupt them. Once Hedwig accepts their non-binary identity, they give Yitzhak one of their wigs on stage as a symbol of forgiveness and solidarity. Yitzhak puts on the wig and dives into the crowd, arriving into the next shot as a glammed up woman, happy and confident in their womanhood. This storyline shows that the issue with these characters' experience doesn't stem only from societal expectations, though they are a major factor, rather it's how these restrictions cause us to act towards other people looking for voices within the wicked little town we call life. In the end, we are responsible for our actions, and the only way to enact change in our society is to live the change we want to see. The final message is that of hope and support of helping those going through their own hardships, of showing empathy to those who need it most. Everyone needs that support in order to discover who they truly are inside. Before I conclude this video, it would be amiss to not bring up how Hedwig was created by John Cameron Mitchell and Stephen Trask, two gay cisgendered men. The off-Broadway production was created in the context of drag shows in the 90s, with the two men looking to explore gender through this character. Mitchell plays Hedwig in both the original production and the film. I've seen complaints on social media, specifically on threads on Reddit, where users in LGBTQ subreddits give their opinions on the film, that the ending promotes heteronormativity, as Hedwig returns to looking like Mitchell without makeup, appearing more masculine. While I don't believe the narrative supports this argument, it's impossible to ignore that the image of a shirtless Mitchell does not do the messaging any favors. As far as I'm aware, there have been no major productions where a non-binary person has played Hedwig or a transgender woman plays Yitzhak. Admittedly, Hedwig is not meant to represent the genderqueer experience as a whole. Rather, it uses the specific non-binary person's struggle with dysphoria as a way to explore how gender roles in society can restrict people mentally and emotionally. The botched sex operation can also hit too close to home for many genderqueer folks and possibly continue a cliché of people transitioning through forced mutilation. I believe that Hedwig's story is specific enough and well handled enough despite being written and produced before genderqueerness was in the public consciousness that these concerns should not get in the way of the positive messages that are more universal, not only to the LGBTQ community, but to marginalized people all over. Of course, I myself am an outsider to the LGBTQ community and representation of this type does not impact me as much. I think a version of Hedwig performed by a non-binary person might make the finale resonate more. 
I also believe that LGBTQ creators should be supported and encouraged to have their voices heard. As outsiders from the popular culture, they can present unique stories and perspectives, even if they aren't specifically about marginalized people. At the end of the day, it would have been great if a genderqueer person had created Hedwig, but we probably would have gotten a very different story. But it ultimately doesn't matter what I think, because this movie isn't about me. It's about supporting the subjects of the film, about the marginalized people in our everyday lives who are held down by societal norms, by toxic people, by microaggressions. I said at the start of this video that my goal is to not only explore what Hedwig and the Angry Inch has to say about identity and the freedom of creative expression, but to encourage people from all backgrounds to respond with their own takes, to educate myself and other viewers about issues we may be unaware of. I want to see people inspired to not only create their own unique works, but to also support other people's unique works, no matter their background. Just as Hedwig uses music to express their true self, their reality, LGBTQ people should not be denied their ability to express their reality. When they aren't taken seriously by society, they need to be supported and heard through art. How can anyone feel validated in their life to begin to heal from their trauma if their experience is not accepted as reality. So hold